These are the MacBook Pro with the M3 Pro and the Mac Studio with the M2 Max, two very powerful Macs released within the last year. They share the same price and carry a number of the same features, but with these MacBooks available with a brand new chipset, does it really even make sense to get the Mac Studio anymore? For the past few weeks, I've been digging into the M3 Pro, trying to figure out how it stacks up against my Mac Studio. There's a lot to love about the Studio, no doubt, but there's some things that I bought it for that after using it for the past six months or so, haven't really worked out the way that I've wanted. Wanted. Today, I want to get into all of that, how both of these stack up against each other in real world performance and what you can expect from both of these machines, good and bad. So if you're curious about either of these machines, maybe you're on the fence about getting a desktop Mac or picking up something more portable like a MacBook, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. Apple released a ton of new Macs and chips in 2023 and depending on what time you're buying, different models have been more attractive at different times. For instance, I bought the M2 Pro Mac Mini in early 2023, and at that time, the M1 version of the Mac Studio was the only one available. The two had very similar performance, but you could tack on some extra storage and get the benefits of the new media engine, Wi-Fi 6E, and Bluetooth 5.3 at no added cost with a Mac Mini so you could actually justify buying a mini over a studio. Fast forward five months later when the 2023 Mac Studio came out and all that changed around again, the mini no longer had the same advantage over the studio and cost wise, it didn't really make as much sense. So part of me was really curious to see if we'd see that kind of flip again with the M3 Pro chip and I've been very surprised after my time with it. First of all, let's just address the obvious differences between the two. The studio is a desktop machine while the MacBook is not, and that comes with its own advantages and disadvantages. The studio takes up a lot less surface area. You can just plunk it down at a desk and it doesn't really look out of place anywhere, where with a MacBook, if you're someone who cares about aesthetics, they can be a lot harder to place and you're likely gonna have to find a laptop stand or hide it away somewhere. I still haven't figured out what I'm gonna do with my space here, whether I'm gonna use this MacBook open or closed, but regardless of that, looking at the actual machine, the studio does have more ports available. There's four Thunderbolt 4 ports, two USB-A ports, an HDMI port, a 10 gig ethernet, and an SD card reader, where on the MacBook, you've just got three Thunderbolt 4 ports, an HDMI port, and an SD card reader. So not only can you plug in more accessories into the studio, but depending on how you want to situate everything at your desk, it can be a little bit more convenient with easy access to ports on the front, but there is one catch with that. When I bought my Mac Studio, one thing that I was excited for was having that easy access to the SD card reader on the front. I know it's not something that everyone uses, but for me personally, and I'm sure a lot of other creatives, you do touch it a lot. And I figured that I would just use that and probably get rid of my CalDigit TS4 hub to free up some extra space. But it turns out that that SD card reader isn't the greatest. I mentioned this in my long-term studio review, but the SD reader works somewhat intermittently. And I asked for feedback from all of you to see if anyone else has had a similar experience. And this seems to be a general issue with a lot of Mac SD readers. So I've just kept my TS4 and because of that, the difference in ports is less of a concern to me. The MacBook Pro also comes with a great display if you choose to use it open at your desk with a decent enough webcam, internal microphone, and speakers, which of course gives you the ability to just pick it up and take it anywhere. Portability and having everything in one small package has always been a huge advantage here, but the biggest reason that you're probably gonna choose a studio over a MacBook would be the increased performance at a lower price. Historically, if you were to look at an M2 Max in a MacBook versus a studio, there was over a thousand dollars difference between the two, but now we're in this really weird place where the M3 series chips are only offered in laptops and iMacs and not in other desktop machines, and that's where things get complicated. These are both a base machine, so the studio is a 12 core CPU, 30 core GPU, 32 gigs of RAM, and a 512 gig SSD, while the M3 Pro MacBook has an 11 core CPU, 14 core GPU, 18 gigs of RAM, and also has a 512 gig SSD. Just looking at those specs, it seems like the studio should be a lot more powerful, but after you start using these machines, both with benchmarks and in real world use, the lines do get blurred more than you might think. In benchmarks, there's a lot of give and take between the two. The M2 Max in the studio does beat out the M3 Pro, mostly with multi-core performance, where I saw between a two and 9% increase in performance, depending on the tool. Single core is around 15% better on the M3 Pro, which is to be expected. And with Xcode benchmark, 
the M2 Max was 13% faster than the M3 Pro. Those tests are mostly all related to the CPU and the GPU is where things get really interesting. The Mac Studio has over double the GPU cores than in the M3 Pro, but it does not have the hardware enabled ray tracing that's built into the M3 Pro, which is pretty well reflected in benchmarks. If you look at Geekbench results, which aren't optimized for the M3 GPU, the M2 Max is gonna perform much better but with tools that do take advantage of the memory optimizations and ray tracing in the M3 Pro, you actually see about a 7% increase in performance in the M3 Pro over the M2 Max. Those tools are great for getting a rough idea of what we're looking at when we're comparing these chipsets and in real world performance, I'd say that sometimes these are things that you can notice and sometimes not so much. In Blender, for instance, these render out images and cycles at about the same speed and overall feel very similar. If you're gonna be doing a lot of work in here with super resource heavy complex scenes, having the extra RAM in the studio is probably advantageous, but they do feel very comparable and that translates some more CPU intensive tasks as well. I know Xcode Benchmark did run a little bit faster on the studio, but just building some of the small to medium sized open source iOS projects that I have here, I found the Pro did build a touch faster and it's honestly really hard to tell the difference between them when you're using Xcode. Similarly with web development, if I have Docker running and I'm working in VS Code, the difference isn't perceivable most of the time. If you're working on a super huge production code base, maybe you'll see that shift a little, but in a general sense, in most areas, these two don't feel all that different from each other. The one place that has probably the most noticeable disparity in performance between the two is gonna be with video editing. Not so much with the actual video editing process, but with rendering out the videos. The M2 Max does have a slightly better media encoding engine with two encoding and decoding engines versus one in the M3 Pro. I found that to equate to about a 15 to 30% decrease in render times on the M2 Max, depending on how long your video is, which may be quite valuable to some folks and others may not care as much if that's something that they're just running in the background while doing other things. But like I said, when you're actually editing a video outside of rendering, they feel very similar. The Mac Studio does go over a timeline a little bit smoother when you have a bunch of effects or clips stacked on it, but I don't know that I would ever notice a difference when they're not side by side. The difference in RAM can come into play sometimes here, but I find that with Final Cut Pro, even when I've got a bunch of color graded clips stacked on top of other clips and some effects and adjustments, it does rarely ever go over 10 gigs memory usage. And provided I'm not trying to do multiple things at once here, the 18 gigs of RAM in the MacBook is more than enough for most things. Now, if you were trying to do a bunch of crazy effects or edit an 8K timeline or something, that would likely be a different story. And that's where you'd see some of these other specs come into play, like the memory bandwidth difference. The studio has a whopping 400 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth, while the M3 Pro only has 150. Only might not be the best phrase there because that is still a lot. And this is one of those cases where on paper, the studio looks like it kills the M3 Pro, but in the real world, most people are never gonna notice. Anything above 100 or 150 here is still super fast. Where this metric comes into play is more so with things like I mentioned, like 8K video editing or large scale simulations or advanced machine learning, that kind of thing. For your average person, if you're just working on software as a mobile or front end developer, or you're making videos like this or other creative workflows, it's not something that you generally have to consider. For reference, the Intel MacBooks released just before Apple came out with their own chips were running somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 gigabytes per second. So even the base M2 and M3 that run at 100 are still quite fast. The same goes for things like SSD speed. The M3 Pro SSD speed runs between 20 and 40% faster when running disk speed tests. But outside of those tests, you can't really tell the difference just using these machines. Sure, there will always be edge cases where it does make a difference but those are few and far between. And overall, there's a lot of give and take between these two, most of which you're never gonna notice. Other things like wireless connectivity are identical between the two. And what it really boils down to for me is just personal preference. I think for a lot of us, we can tend to get caught up a little bit too much in the latest and greatest comparing specs and deciding that one machine is gonna be noticeably faster or better than the other without considering what we actually need. A lot of these differences in specs mean nothing to the average person and if you're trying to decide between these machines from a practical standpoint, 
I think it's worth spending some time trying to understand what your pain points are. If things feel slow on your current machine, open up Activity Monitor and see where the bottleneck is or how much resources the apps you use actually take up. If you find yourself having trouble with ports or accessories, take note of that and try and use that as a guide rather than just benchmarks and spec sheets. In regards to these machines, both are super performant and facilitate most people's needs. I know for me, if I had to decide between these two, I'd probably just get the M3 Pro MacBook because you get the added portability with an amazing screen and probably better resale value when the time comes for that as well. The studio will probably get the M3 Max in the spring as that's usually when it gets upgraded, but regardless, these are both very powerful and you can't go wrong with either of them. That being said, I would love to hear from everyone else on this. If you had to choose between these two, which one would you pick and why? Let me know in the comments down below. That's all I got for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video and you found it useful. If you did, feel free to hit that like button. If you wanna see more tech related content or start a barbershop quartet with me where we sing songs about USB port specifications, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.